Welcome to Conflicts Unveiled. Today, we delve into the extraordinary life of a man whose strategic brilliance altered the course of history, Chester W. Nimitz. He was one of the highest-ranking officers in U.S. military history and one of the most important commanders in the United States Navy. Born on February 24, 1885, to a recently widowed mother, Chester Nimitz spent his early years with his mother and paternal grandfather, Charles Nimitz. He regarded his grandfather as the most important man in his life, and the advice received from his grandfather proved to be a moral beacon for Nimitz. Let me share one story about young Nimitz. While on his ship, the Decatur, during a storm, the ship's engineer informed Nimitz that the ship was flooding and was going to sink. Just look on page 84 of Barton's engineering manual, he said. It will tell you what to do. And so the ship was saved, thanks to his photographic memory. Also, Nimitz was almost court-martialed because he ran his ship aground. He brought the Decatur into the Batangas Harbor in the Philippines, and it ran aground on a mud bank. After failing to get the ship off, he remembered his grandfather's advice, don't worry about things over which you have no control, and ordered a cot to be brought to the bridge. He slept until the tide rose and the ship was freed. Luckily, he had a flawless record and was not severely reprimanded. As an admiral, he would tell this story whenever anyone was quick to judge a man's career because of a single mistake. That combination of confident calm and technical knowledge marked his entire naval career. On December 7, 1941, hell broke loose in the Pacific. The Imperial Japanese Navy launched a strike against the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. At that time, Nimitz was serving as chief of the Bureau of Navigation, Ten days later, President Franklin Roosevelt chose Nimitz from among 28 officers, all of whom were senior to him, to take over command at Pearl Harbor, replacing Admiral Husband Kimmel. Roosevelt told Nimitz to get the hell out to Pearl Harbor and don't come back until the war is won. Earlier that year, Nimitz was offered command of the Pacific Fleet, but he turned it down out of respect for the senior officers. Upon arriving in Hawaii, he faced a challenging task, not only to repair the fleet as quickly as possible, but also to prevent panic and restore the staff's morale. He realized that the disaster was not Kimmel's fault and could have befallen any admiral. Kimmel's staff assumed that they would be fired, but Nimitz took command and kept all of them. He knew that they couldn't have predicted the attack on Pearl Harbor and saw no point in blaming them for something almost no one could have predicted. His calm attitude was necessary because things were going bad. The Japanese were victorious everywhere. They captured Singapore and Hong Kong, the Dutch East Indies, and Guam. Worst of all, the Japanese forced the surrender of the Philippines' garrison. Nimitz assumed command of the Pacific Fleet on December 31, 1941, on the deck of a submarine named Grayling. The choice of a submarine deck for the change of command appropriately recognized that the U.S. Navy submarines were among the initial vessels to take an offensive stance against the Japanese Navy. In fact, Nimitz's son served as an officer on the Sturgeon submarine in the Philippines when the U.S. entered the war. Initially, the president and his war cabinet decided that the main focus was defeating Germany. So U.S. forces in the Pacific would get limited support for the time being. Despite the heavy losses that the Pacific Fleet suffered, some key elements were untouched. The aircraft carriers. Nimitz's first move was on the 18th of April, 1942. It inflicted little material damage but had an enormous morale boost for the American public. The aircraft carrier named Hornet, newly transferred to the Pacific, sailed deep into enemy territory and launched 16 B-25 bombers towards Japan, an almost impossible mission to bomb Tokyo. The B-25s were modified to bear a long flight with a heavy load. After the mission was completed, the bombers had to land in China. This action, known as the Doolittle Raid, named after the commander James H. Doolittle, caused panic within the Japanese high command. The Japanese were worried that their homeland was exposed to American aircraft carriers. Nimitz's biggest gamble of the war 
came two months later when he assembled every available American carrier in the Pacific to defend against a Japanese attack on Midway Island. One of the men under Nimitz's command, Edwin Layton, was friends with Joseph Rochefort, a man who worked in Hawaii deciphering Japanese communications. When Rochefort saw the head of naval intelligence wasn't receptive to his evidence that the Japanese were planning an attack on Midway Island, he got the information directly to Nimitz through Leighton. When they had a meeting to plan the defense of Midway, Rochefort was able to present what was essentially the Japanese battle plan. It seems that keeping the staff was a good decision, as it's likely none of that would have happened if Nimitz had replaced Leighton. He ordered the damaged Yorktown to join the Enterprise and Hornet and sail to Midway. The commander of the task force was Admiral Raymond Spruance, personally appointed by Nimitz after Bull Halsey ended up in the hospital. Nimitz risked everything in this battle. If the American carriers were lost, it would have been very difficult to protect Hawaii and the East Coast. The Japanese fleet approached Midway on June 2nd. Nimitz wrote to his wife, We are better prepared than ever before. What should have been a Japanese surprise attack became the turning point of the Pacific War. In less than 10 minutes, beginning at 10.22 a.m. on June 4, 1942, American naval aviators disabled three Japanese aircraft carriers and destroyed more than 200 enemy aircraft, after catching them rearming and refueling on the decks. The Japanese launched a counterattack from the remaining carrier, an attack that managed to sink USS Yorktown. These events ended the Japanese supremacy in the Pacific, paving the way for Nimitz to launch the first American offensive of the war on the island of Guadalcanal two months later. The victory achieved at Midway also gave the American troops a huge morale boost, as they had no victory since the war began. Nimitz decided to go on the offensive. Finding out that the Japanese constructed an airfield on Guadalcanal, it was decided that the island needed to be taken. This would deny the Japanese a base from which they threatened New Guinea. The 1st Marine Division, supported by Army troops, landed on the island on August 7, 1942. The Japanese were surprised being initially pulled back, and the American troops conquered the airfield, naming it Henderson Field. Later, the Japanese put all available manpower into attempting to regain the airfield, resulting in bloody confrontations that cost the lives of 30,000 individuals on both sides. In February 1943, the Japanese troops finally evacuated the island, and Nimitz wanted to keep up the momentum. He developed a revolutionary island-hopping strategy, which consisted of selectively bypassing heavily fortified enemy-held islands and instead capturing and establishing control over strategically important but less fortified islands. The goal was to create a network of bases that would provide airfields and naval facilities for the Allied forces to launch further attacks closer to Japan. Roosevelt had to split the Pacific into two theaters. The Southwest Pacific Theater, commanded by General Douglas MacArthur, and the Pacific Ocean Area, commanded by Nimitz. The reasoning behind this decision was the disagreements between Nimitz and MacArthur about the island hopping strategy. MacArthur wanted a more direct approach, from Australia to Japan via New Guinea as well as the Philippines. Nimitz's area of responsibility was quiet for most of 1943 as he built up resources, but he still managed to deal a really important blow against the Japanese. His codebreakers discovered the travel itinerary of Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese Combined Fleet and the mastermind behind Pearl Harbor and the Battle of Midway. American P-38 Lightning fighters attacked Yamamoto's aircraft and ended his life, leaving a void in Japan's naval leadership and dealing a massive morale blow to the Japanese public. Nimitz was ready for his offensive in November 1943. He began with the Gilbert Islands, invading Tarawa and Makin, using these to attack the Marshall Islands. The Marianas and Palau Islands were the next important strategical points, because using them, American bombers could reach Japan's mainland. The Japanese were really determined to fight to avoid these consequences, 
resulting in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which was a disaster for the Japanese Navy. Another disastrous battle for the Japanese was the Battle of Leyte Gulf, losing 26 ships, including the battleship Musashi, as well as some of their last carriers. The Japanese fleet never sailed forth in any strength again. In December 1944, Nimitz received the five-star fleet admiral rank, along with William Leahy, Ernest King, and William Halsey. In February 1945, the Marines conquered Iwo Jima, one of the last obstacles to Japan. As the Allies closed in, the Japanese started to fight more and more fiercely, preferring to die than be taken prisoners, fighting to the death. The Battle of Okinawa gave Nimitz and other Allied commanders a taste of what they should expect when they launched Operation Downfall, huge casualties from both sides. Everyone knew, even if the Japanese were bombed regularly, they had no intention to surrender. Because of this, the newly appointed president, Harry Truman, approved the use of two atomic bombs to force the Japanese leaders to surrender. On September 2, 1945, the Japanese formally surrendered to the Allies on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Nimitz was the one who accepted the surrender on behalf of the United States. World War II was over. After the war, he supported Hyman Rickover's plan to build USS Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered submarine. He never officially retired from the Navy, as a five-star admiral was considered to be on duty for the rest of his life, being awarded benefits and drawing a full pay. Nimitz died at his home in San Francisco on February 20, 1966. In 1975, the United States Navy honored Admiral Chester Nimitz's legacy by naming a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier after him, the USS Nimitz. This class of carriers, known as the Nimitz class, is one of the largest ever built and remains a cornerstone of the U.S. Navy's fleet. This was the only right way to honor the legacy of the admiral that ruled the Pacific.